Welcome back students to our Chemistry 1510 video notes. In this section, we're going to talk about quantum numbers. So quantum numbers are numerical values that essentially give a street address to an electron. So when you think about your street address, your street address has multiple components. You have your street number, or well, let's see, it's not your street number, um, your house number. So you have your house number, you have the street you live on, you have the city, and you have the state. So like how your street address has these four components, your electrons have four components that define where that electron is expected to be. The first component is called the principal quantum number, which is n. You have seen n before because n is the shell or the energy level. So notice how this uh, numerical value has three different names for it, right? Shell, energy level, principal quantum number, all describing the same thing. So if we look at our Bohr model of the atom, and this is our nucleus, and this is kind of concentric circle one and two and three and four, right? These were your shells that we're talking about. When you look at the allowed values for n, n can be any whole number from zero to infinity. Now, the thing is, for our ground state electron configurations, which is what you've been drawing, ground state means lowest energy, your n can only go up to a certain value. So your n can only go up to 7 if we're talking about a ground state electron configuration. But hypothetically, n could really go past that all the way up to a infinity. So this is telling you your shell number. When you look at your electron configuration, like if we just draw a quick one, the n is here. So this is describing your n value. Then if we go to your secondary quantum number, which we call L, this has a relationship to your principal quantum number. And the relationship is when you look at L, you're going to take your n minus 1, so L can equal n minus 1 through the number line all the way down to 0. So for example, if your n is 3, then your possible L's are going to be 2, 1, and 0. So again, these have to be whole numbers. So your L, the highest L that's possible, is 1 less than your N value, and then you hit every whole number on your way down to 0. Your secondary quantum numbers are going to refer in our little electron configuration here to the subshell. So your secondary quantum numbers is talking about what subshell you're looking at. So although we have numerical values here in our definition of what L can be, we have uh, alphabet representations over here. So when L is 0, we call that an S orbital. When L is 1, we call that a P orbital. When L is 2, that's a D orbital. When L is 3, that's an F orbital. 
If we didn't put letters in, it would get really confusing very quickly. So the letters really do help in the grand scheme of things. So then let's look at the magnetic quantum number. For the magnetic quantum number, this is going to have values of negative L through the number line to zero through the number line to positive L. So for example, if L equals two, then the M sub L values are gonna be negative two, negative one, zero, positive one, and positive two. So these M sub L values are more related to the orbital than the subshell. What I mean by that is when L equals two, like we saw in this example here, remember an L of two is a D orbital. When you look at a D orbital in your energy level diagrams, your D orbital, we'll, we'll pretend we've got a D and who cares what the number is out in front. We'll put a three for the, just for funsies you will see five blanks there because your M sub L is telling you how many orbitals are in the subshell. So see how there are one, two, three, four, five um, M sub L values, and there are one, two, three, four, five orbitals in your D subshell. So this is telling you how many orbitals are in the subshell. Then our final quantum number, whoops, is M sub S. This is your spin quantum number. This only has two allowed values, plus one half and minus one half. This quantum number is the simplest, yet it gives students a lot of concern because they say, how am I supposed to know if it's plus one half or minus one half? It doesn't matter because if you had to assign an example of a, qu a quantum number set to an electron, what would matter is if we're talking about something nice and simple like the 1s orbital, then this electron would have a plus one half and this electron would have to have a minus one half because the spin quantum number makes sure that no two electrons in an atom have the same set of quantum numbers, which I'm gonna abbreviate as QN. So for example, if we're looking at the two electrons in helium, which would be, you know, this 1s example, Electron number one for helium would have an N of one, an L of zero, an M sub L of zero, and then an M sub S of, just pick one, let's say plus one half. Then the other electron for helium would have to have N equals one, L equals zero, M sub L equals zero, and M sub S would have to be the opposite sign so that there is a distinguishing factor between the two electrons because your two electrons in an atom cannot have the same set of quantum numbers. That is what the Pauli exclusion principle says. So a lot of times people get really confused about quantum numbers. And I want to take a moment to extend the length of this video to talk about how those quantum numbers can relate to how we see the periodic table. 
So if we go back to our periodic table in this format where we're seeing the blocks that are given, N is very much related to the, the number on the periodic chart. And by that number, I mean the period, right? And these are your period values. So notice how in S block, right? So S block is your red block. N equals the period number. Uh, then in your P block, Oops, wait, I want to make this more organized. Sorry. In your S block, your uh, period That's going to be the same thing for your P block. So in your P block, you also see the period and N are the same thing. What I mean by that is see how you have period number three here? and then you have a three here and a three here. So your period equals your energy level. When you move into the fourth block, notice how your, I'm sorry, I said fourth block, your fourth row. Notice how when you're in the D block, you take the period minus one and that equals N. So here, if you're in the S block, your period and your N, your energy level, still are the same. But when you come into the D block, you have to drop one to equal your energy level. For your F block, see how there's an asterisk and a cross here? That means that this section should go up into here. So if you look at an extended periodic table, Oh, that doesn't look as pretty as I wanted. That's all right, we'll survive. It's S, F, D, P. So the F comes in right here where this is period six, period seven, but this is four F and this is five F. So for the F block, it's your period minus two equals N. So this is going to be one of those things that helps us refrain from memorizing the orbital um, diagram order. So instead, if we know these two things, then we can use our periodic table to figure out the electron configuration. When we look at L, L is related to your blocks on the periodic table. What I mean by that is remember if L is zero, that's your S block. If L is one, that's your P block. If L is two, that's your D block. If L is three, that's your F block. And on the periodic table, we have those sections blocked off or marked off in these highlighted different colors. Then M sub L, remember that this talked about how many orbitals were in your subshell. So if we go back to our L of two example, your M sub L, ooh, that's an S, was, had possible values of minus two, minus one, zero, plus one, and plus two. So we said that in a D block, because of this, a D block should have uh, five orbitals. Let's see how that relates to the periodic table. We'll scroll up to the top, and we'll remember that each orbital can contain two electrons. So if each orbital is containing two electrons, then each uh, area or each orbital is going to take uh, essentially two columns. So here I've got one, two columns, which is going to be uh, filling up one orbital. And then one, two columns fills up another and then one, two columns fills up another, 
and then one, two fills up another, and then one, oops, two fills up another. So that's one, two, three, four, five. So I essentially, I have five pairs of columns and I have five orbitals. Remember that your D block houses 10 electrons. And if we scroll up one more time, if you count, you should have 10, uh, let's see, 10 columns in your D block. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, because your D block can house ten electrons. So what you're going to start to see is it all just fits together really beautifully. So in our last little section, I want to talk about some shortcuts and some exceptions. So when you look at an electron configurations, you're going to see a shortcut method, which is great because uh, you're going to get really bored of writing out 1s2, 2s2, blah, 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 whatever, whatever, all, all the time. So if we write the electron configuration for sodium really quick, that is 1s2, 2s2, uh, 2p6, 3s1. And then neon is going to be 1s2, 2s2, and 2p6. What I see here is that sodium has a section in its electron configuration that matches that of neon. And you might say, why in the world are you using neon? Well, neon is a noble gas. And noble gases have a full shell of electrons. So if we look at neon, neon's electron configuration is housed inside of sodium. So the shortcut is to say I have neon's electron configuration and then past that I have 3s1. So this is the shortcut method to writing electron configurations. The thing that you have to be cautious about is in brackets, you may only have noble gases. It's your only choice. Then there's gonna be one or two exceptions to the electron configurations. And in actuality, there's probably more like five. So an example of an exception to the electron configurations is copper. When we look at copper, everything is full up until argon. And then past argon, you have 4s2 and 3d9. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. So what's going to happen with something like copper? And remember, I'm kind of cheating by just saying everything below here is argon. Um, so the, the thing that's going to happen is see how your 3D is one away from being full. There's a special energy associated with a full or half full 3Ds. So full or half full D blocks are more stable than we would anticipate. So it's more stable for the um, copper if this electron in the 4S comes over to the 3D. So what copper's electron configuration will look like instead is only one electron in the 4s, but a completely full shell in the 3d. So why this happens, I don't really know. But we do know that we can figure out these electron configurations and we can measure the energy associated with them. So when we stay, say more stable, we mean lower energy. So we know this electron configuration is lower in energy. 
Other things that have exceptions are going to be uh, chromium, molybdenum, uh, again, copper, gold, and silver. I mixed those up when I said them out loud. Uh, so that is plenty for one video. Quantum numbers is very difficult. You're probably going to want to t spend some extra time on that. So as always, thank you for your attention. This is Katoni signing out.